hit the record button welcome back to the protectors podcast today i am joined by an excellent guest an expert in leadership and he's doing a lot of great things out there and hey you know what we served in the same areas back in the day and we're talking back in the day like the 90s wow Stone um age. <laughs> whew, i tell you chris it's getting weird talking about it like that isn't it like i know yeah it's like you know the it's like wow it's the 90s holy cow it's it's almost y2k and it's like, oh man, that was so ancient history. I, it's so, I don't feel that old, but now I'm saying like back in the day and people before people were like, oh, back in the day, it was like five years ago. I'm like, I'm like back in the day, it was like 30 years ago now. Yeah. 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 No, you're right. But uh, yeah, you're as old as you feel. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And UK, I was with, um, I was with my wife and she was going through IOB, not IOB, the uh, military officer basic course at Wachuca at the time. So we're in Arizona, like right at the cusp of Y2K. Wow. And it was interesting times when people think about Y2K. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot yeah, of yeah, preparation like in, going on. It was Armageddon. It was like the, yeah. you know, all the computers going to melt down and stuff. And then, you know, it's just, it was a nothing burger, which was, which was good. Yeah. It was, thank God. Holy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we just passed September 11th. And usually you're like, hey, you know, where were you on September 11th? But now, like with, with us, be like, where were you at Y2K too? You know? Right. Yeah. 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 And then the uh, the Cold War era, and but then in we progressed, and you progressed too. Your military career spanned both of them: the Cold War and jumping right into the middle of things. Yeah, my first assignment was on the old East-West German border. You know, oh, staring yeah. at the uh, you know the East Germans and the you know um, behind their fences. You know, I it. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah, they had this these three fence lines designed to keep people in. You know, people wanted to get out of East Germany, uh, and uh, they they had these fence lines and guard dogs and mines and stuff like that. And every time we do a border patrol, there'd be a you know there'd be a, a a shooting at a border crossing point. You know, somebody trying to escape. And um, yeah, so that was my first assignment, and um, and then. You know, went through the, you know, the, went through the nineties, never, never went to the Balkans. That was kind of the big thing in the nineties. I, I was, uh, I was fortunate to be sent to graduate school at the university of Wisconsin and then taught at West point for three years and uh, taught in the history department. So then after that, I mean, just a few years after that, it was September 11th. And then, then of course uh, the whole world changed for a lot of us. It did. And I, I told a story the other day. I was at, I was actually in the border patrol, but I was doing my IOBC at the time, infantry officer basic course. And I remember September 11th, we were doing our urban training. We we're just about to go out to the field and all the cadre pulled out everybody from New York and said, Hey, anybody have any family that works in the towers, blah, blah, blah. And we didn't know what was going on. Wow. And that changed. And I always tell people, I'm like, and it really relates with me and you too, is because a lot of people I interview joined post 9-11. You and I started and a peacetime military. And then we jumped into war. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I mean, September 11th, that was at the Naval War College and, and we were starting getting ready to start class and somebody runs into the classroom and says, turn on the television. A plane just hit the world trade center. Like, what? So we turn on television. And, you know, it was after the first plane to hit. And then we see the second plane going in. It's just like, you know, wow, this is, you know, our whole world is getting ready to change. Um, well, so, that yeah. was, you know, it's almost like a similar situation. You're in a military training environment with all of these different officers. And then to go from that, like, you know, fighting the Krasnovians, these fictitious, like big conventional war forces to getting into low intensity conflict. So did you, it must've been a gradual change. I don't, must not have just changed overnight, but how did you see your career transition from that you know, the perspective of these cavalry conventional forces into low intensity conflict. Yeah, of course, it was a huge reorientation and it took took the military a while to get it right, um, at least at the, you know, at the kind of the tactical level, the strategic level. We never quite got things right. 
Um, and I write about that. My newest book is called Zero Sum Victory, What We're Getting Wrong About War. And uh, yeah, that one. Um, and, and I write about you know, why we have this track record, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and then, you know, not to mention Libya, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, of these, of these interventions turning into fiascos. And, and, you know, the, our troopers on the ground at the, you know, at the, at the individual, the squad platoon company battalion levels there, I mean, they're, they're all doing things to a high standard. They're doing exactly what, what folks are telling them to do. Oftentimes we're not telling them to do the right things. Um, and then we don't work together very well as a, as a government. So, you know, the military can't win wars on its own, especially these kind of wars that turn on political legitimacy and, you know, much more so on that than on, you know, battlefield, uh, battlefield tactics. Um, so it was, you know, to the army's credit, I mean, you know, the, and the military, the broader military to adapt to, you know, this new operating environment was, was, um, was really impressive. I, I worry now, quite frankly, that there's this, well, we'll never do that again. Um, you know, insurgent, we might be done with insurgencies, but insurgencies might not be done with us. Well, you will never do that again, but we forget. And that is one of the reasons I like books. We forget how history works. Yeah. You know, video, social media, everything's two minutes diameter 20 minutes you're getting a brief but when you write a book like zero sum victory you're getting a history lesson and i wish you know these are like you know when you think back about vietnam you had hackworth wrote the books um and a ton of other different books out there writing about those experiences right. but the lessons get lost yeah yeah we we kind of wish them away and then we don't want to think about it anymore we'll not do that again and then and then you know boom there we there we are um, I, yeah, I, I think, a, you know, a broader point about this is, you know, what's the best way to learn about things like leadership and best way to think, you know, learn about things like strategy. Well, it's through three, you've got to do three perspectives, you know, theory, history, and experience, you know, those are the three. Um, and so in leadership, the warriors are one of the, one of the books that I, the first book I wrote, um, is, I've organized it in those three sections, you know, and you've got to have all three theory, history, and, and experience to have a, a good understanding, a good, a good program of study, if you will, for something like leadership. You know, if you've got theory and, and history, but you got no experience, um, then you, know, you, you, you run the risk of getting ivory tower solutions where, yeah, you know, it works in theory, but it doesn't work in the real world. You know, it's like trying to make breakfast with a chocolate frying pan. It's just mm -hmm. a big mess. Um, if you have theory and experience, but you've got no history, so you don't study history of leaders and organizations, then you wind up being at risk of, of succumbing to fads, like falling hook, line, and sinker into fads. And so in the 1990s, when we were, we were growing up back in the day, you had things like, uh, the one minute manager, mm -hmm. um, management by objective management by walking around as opposed to management by sitting on my butt. And, you know, they were like here today and gone the next and, and rightly so. And of course we got our, 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 our fads today. So if, if you, if you don't, if you don't look at history and look at some of the enduring, um, you know, themes, in history, uh, look at how people historically have dealt with analogous situations. They're quite the same, but they're, they can rhyme. Then, you know, history gives you that perspective. And then if you have history and experience, but you don't have theory, you don't have the big ideas, then you're, you're going to be in the taxter, tactical hamster wheel. Um, and you are, you are going to be like the, the person who is, plays chess one move at a time. And if you're up against somebody who knows the queen's gambit, you're going to lose. So you've got to have all three in place. And, and the, the more that you integrate those three, the bigger that circle of the Venn diagram, uh, if you will, gets. And, and the more, the more innovative, the more adaptable you become as a, as a leader, as a strategic thinker, as a, 
you know, as a business leader. It does translate into the civilian market. Absolutely. And like a lot of the theory, history and experience, it really, you need the experience. You could theorize all day long. You could read every right. book in the world, but if you don't have an experience, and I've seen a lot of like I've been in the government for you know not including the military, it's almost twenty three years, done these executive leadership programs, a bunch of different supervisory leadership programs. Just came off a presidential management rotation, right. and a lot of it is you learn the theory, you you learn the history of why you do things, but then you get an experience. You have to get a practical experience. When I was younger in my career, I think it was 2011, I wanted to know how to integrate different law enforcement tactics and techniques from different perspectives from a federal and a state and local. And I went to work in Camden, New Jersey for 90 days working with a drug team. And I got a different perspective. And I learned that some of the things I was thinking about in theory were great. But in practice, you know, it, it really wouldn't work unless you had the experience. Yeah, you, you got to be in the arena. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's the greatest teacher of leadership. Um, and you, you got to be in the arena. You got to learn about it. And then I've also found that, you know, as one of the things I'd like to do is help leaders um, get good at getting better. And to get good at getting better, you've got to learn, you've got to practice, and then you've got to get the feedback and accountability, the coaching. Uh, so as a, as a trusted advisor, that's what I, that's what I do. I help you build your capacity and, and you know, hold you accountable, help you be accountable in common sense ways. And because without that feedback, uh, without somebody helping to shorten our path to success, we can often, we can zigzag um, or get into all sorts of dead ends. Whereas if we've got a, coaches and mentors and trusted advisors, they, they help us get around those obstacles and shorten our paths to success. So it's kind of more like this as opposed to, you know, the, the zigzag. I, I like the idea of the strategic leaders Academy. And I want to know more about that because we're lacking the there's lacking of positive and incredible leadership training out there. There's very lacking in where you can find it and who it's available to. So what is a strategic leaders Academy? Yeah, it's, it's a leadership consulting franchise. Um, if you want to be a franchisee, you've got to be a, a military veteran. And I hope you build your, your consulting business. And then we each serve different, different clients. Um, so I like to serve small business leaders and solo practitioners, you know, help them, help them get good at getting better. We've got others who help athletic teams, government, departments, uh, small businesses, nonprofits. So that's, that's what it's all about. And we like to help organizations get better in three things, leadership, culture, and strategy. And, you know, we've all uh, walked a mile in those shoes, had to have shown um, results, you know, good outcomes in, you know, in, in those experiences and, and the, the ability to, to be able to coach and teach and mentor others to get good at getting better. I like how you, you integrate the military community in there as well. And one thing about we've learned in the military is accountability and getting that out there to the civilian workforce and teaching the civilian workforce. And I like the idea of the consulting business too. So let's say you have someone like me, former captain, so-and-so uh, trained in Lean Six Sigma and all this other good stuff. And I want to jump into the, the consulting business and what kind of recommendations I go and check out your website and say, Hey, what's going on, Chris? Yeah, that's the, that's the biggest thing is, is we just have a conversation about it and you know, there are different flavors of consultants and consulting. So some consultants are like subject matter experts. And so you become a contractor um, for your expertise. Others are, much more comfortable in a consulting firm, you know, big consulting firm. So it's kind of like in the military, you got this big structure and you're part of the structure. And, and there are lots of people who just, who feel very comfortable in the structure. That's where they prefer to be. Um, and then you've got, you've got your boutique consulting firm. So you kind of have your smaller ones. Um, and then you've got the, you know, the truly bold, I like to think are the uh, solo practitioners. 
Um, and so what, what we do at SLA is, is help solo practitioners. You know, what, one of the things that I do is help solo practitioners build, build consulting businesses that they love. Well, you know, one thing you have an expertise at is at consulting at the strategic level, especially the SecDef's office. How did that all come about? I was, well, I was, a, I, I was a lead, led a task force of about 800 paratroopers in Eastern Afghanistan in 2007. And it was a 15 month deployment. That was a long time. We got to do two fighting seasons in Afghanistan. And the place we came into in the summer of 2007 was one of the most violent parts of the country, deadliest parts of the country. In fact, six of my paratroopers were killed in action there. And, and then what our paratroopers did there was, was remarkable in motivating a large insurgent group to stop fighting and switch sides. And they were fighting the Taliban right to the very end. So the violence levels in summer 2008 were radically different. And so that, that got people's attention. Um, and I was asked to come to the, when the Obama administration came in in 2009, they asked me to come help write a new strategy for Afghanistan. I then went out as a senior advisor to generals McChrystal and Petraeus, came back in, in uh, late 2010, and we were starting these talks with the Taliban, and, and I was asked to be the Secretary of Defense's personal representative in the talks with the Taliban. So that meant uh, declining a command, retiring from the army. And so I became a DOD civilian, Pentagon civilian for two and a half years, beat my head against the wall. I wrote about it a little bit and zero sum victory. Uh, the talks unfortunately didn't work out. And so I resigned in 2014 after doing a final tour as a senior advisor to general Dunford and, and then started my own consulting business. Talk about transition. I mean, you look like you're on your way. And then to make a critical decision point to change the tra trajectory of your life, that must have been, you know, we talk about, yeah, you have a lot of experience with leadership, but taking off the uniform and taking that bold move after, uh, you know, decades of service, th that must have been one of the most critical decisions of life. Well, it was, it was, it was not easy because commanding the, a cavalry regiment would have been a heck of a lot more fun than uh, you know, than, than what I what I was going to do. But I I thought that if I can, if my background and expertise can help bring a successful end to this war, then that's that's how I can better serve. Um, unfortunately, those talks didn't work out. Uh, but the we then I then got involved in some unofficial talks. It was called Track Two talks in 2017 and 2018 with, you know, it was the Taliban and we talked to people in Washington, DC, people in Kabul and, and we're able, it was part of the catalyst that got the talks going again in 2018, which eventually led to, um, you know, led to the Doha agreement in Afghanistan, which was kind of an unfortunate, it wasn't, it wasn't a very good agreement, unfortunately. I write about this in Zero Sum Victory about how we go from 2001 where the Taliban are offering to surrender and we tell them to pound sand to 2020 when we're left with negotiating an agreement in which we trade a total troop withdrawal for Taliban promises of no terrorism. Uh, yep. And here we yeah. are. And here we I'm looking are. forward to uh, <laughs> I definitely want to read the book now. You know, I, I I have so many books and I only get to read like a, a small portion of them. And these are absolutely on my reading list because I, I we need to learn more about leadership. We need to take these lessons learned right. and share them. And I absolutely agree. I mean, when did you decide to, you know, become an author on top of everything else you're doing? It was, I was at graduate school in the University of Wisconsin, and I always liked leadership books. I always loved studying leadership. And so I'm looking in the bookshelves, and there's all sorts of books written by business leaders, and you know, some are good and some, some are not so good. 
with military, you really didn't have much of anything. I mean, you had biographies, autobiographies, you had, you know, histories, but you didn't really have any books that talked about like forward-looking leadership. And I thought, well, nobody really wants to read a book on leadership by, you know, a senior captain named Chris Kalinda, but I bet I could put together an anthology with chapters from a bunch of different, really awesome people. And I'm going to West Point where we've got all sorts of people that mm -hmm. have, are able to put together these chapters and, you know, have the experience and the history and all of that. And so that's what I did. And the book came out, the leadership, the warrior's art came out originally in 2001, right before 9-11. And over 60,000 people and using it for their leader development program. Yeah, that's it. And people took the book into, into combat with them, um, which is so gratifying. And then about a year ago, the publisher and I were just talking back and forth. And, and you know, we said, lots changed since 2001. You know, we got the, we got the global war on terror. We got, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell we've got the end of combat exclusion. So all branches and all jobs in the military are open to, to, you know, men and women. Um, and, and then of course you've got all of the, the social unrest that we've been dealing with. So why don't we update the book? And, and so I streamlined a few chapters to make room. We added new chapters, some new chapters, three new chapters, and then key takeaways and action steps for, uh, for the, you know, all of the chapters. And uh, so that, that book just, that second edition just came out kind of 20th uh, anniversary edition. So our goal is that the book is as relevant for the next 20 years as the first edition was for the previous 20. Well, it looks like I found my next book. Cause that's, I absolutely love anthologies. I love when people bring in like different experts and I am going to pick your brain eventually, you know, that's going to be one of the, the prices to pay for coming on a show. Yeah, let's do that. Cause I want to write a book similar to this, but not with war lessons learned, but lessons learned from, you know, different generations of our nation's protectors uh, and how they became the protagonist that they are the hero of the story. And I really, I love anthologies and I'm looking forward to that one first. And then I, the zero sum is next, but you're not only doing, leadership you're giving back to the community and that is one kind of one of the reasons i really wanted to have you on the show is i love when people give back and give back and they keep giving back they don't just do their service get their paycheck and move on right. they're giving back and you're doing something really cool a 1700 mile bike ride yeah yeah i uh, i mentioned that six of my paratroopers were killed in action back in 2007 and their names are uh, chris pfeiffer adrian hike Jacob Lowell, Ryan Fritchie, Dave Boris, and Tom Bostic. And I've always wanted to do something special to commemorate their service and sacrifice and, and, and to help people see them as flesh and blood, not thank you for your service heroes yeah. on a pedestal or something like that. You know, it was real people, real families. Um, and, and so coming up on 15 years and I was like, all right, it's, you know, it's, I ain't getting any younger time to do time to time to put your money where the mouth is. And I figured I could drive the, I could visit each of their graves. They're buried from Nebraska, pretty much due East all the way to Arlington. And I could drive 1700 miles, but that'd be, that'd be kind of lame. I could walk the distance, but it just, I would just take an exorbitant amount of time. It's not feasible. So I was like, I know what I can do. I can ride a bike. <laughs> I could pedal a bike 1700 miles. Darn it. There are only three problems. Um, I didn't own a bike. <laughs> I hadn't ridden a bicycle in 20 years and I had no idea um, how I was going to pull this off. So I, I went to the local, to the bike shop a place called wheel and sprocket. They've, they've been awesome. And I said, here's what I'm doing. And they looked at me like I was a little crazy. Then they said, okay, well, here's the bike that you want. Um, I hired a cycling coach to put together a training program to get my butt in shape. And, you know, for 16 months is what I've been doing. Wow. One of the things I've been doing, I've been training for this for 16 months. 
And then I started telling people so we don't chicken out. So yeah, you mm -hmm. mentioned accountability, you know, accountability is what I do professionally. And uh, so I'm going to put my money where my mouth is, set the example. So that's what I've been doing. And, um, and so that, that ride's going to start, uh, it's going to go on September 25th, which is 15 years to the day that Chris Pfeiffer died at wounds. Um, his parents will be there, Mike and Darlena. Uh, his widow, Karen, will be there. And so will his daughter, Peyton, who was born two days after Chris died. So she never met her dad. Um, should be there. And uh, yeah, and then uh, it'd be 20, about 28 days. So I, I plan to be at Arlington National Cemetery at Tom Bostick's gravesite in uh, October 22nd, and then ho host an event on October 23rd to kind of celebrate the end of the ride. And the ride is, is, is well, a twofold mission. One is to honor the dead, and, and the second is to, is to support the living. So I'm raising funds for the ride for the Saber Six Foundation. And that foundation helps my unit's veterans and their families and their descendants uh, get the help that they need to achieve new dreams. So, you know, one of the challenges that, that veterans face is the happiness curve. And happiness curve, um, according to many studies, follows a U. So at the top of the U on one side, you're about age 20 or so. And the top of the U on the other side, you're at about age 60 something, early 60s. The bottom of the U, according to some studies, is age 47.2 to be specific. And, and what, what happens with a lot of folks is they will look at combat, their time in combat as among the happiest days of their lives. Despite the heartache, despite the hardship, despite the fighting, the things that you're doing for, you know, 15 months in this case, um, people look as among the happiest days of their lives. And part of it is because they're at the top of this happiness curve. So biologically, there are things going on. And there's also you have this amazing sense of purpose. Like I am, I am deployed in a combat zone. I'm fighting for my country. I'm fighting to protect the people back home. This extraordinary sense of belonging like the person to my left and a person to my right they get me they've got my back and i've got theirs um i know i matter i know i count and they've got the the support of the united states of america at their backs helping them be successful so you got all that and then you leave it and you leave that sense of purpose. You know, you enter civilian life, you may not have that same sense of belonging. You're like nobody gets me. You know, nobody's got me. Uh, nobody knows how to help me. What good did any of that do? What good did any of that do for me right now? And, you know, for some people, they're able to make that a pivot right away you know, or very quickly. So their you is pretty shallow and they find new purpose and belonging and, and they're, they're ready to soar to new heights. Um, other people that, that use more pronounced, they get into what we might call midlife crisis and we want to help them bounce back stronger and soar to new heights. And then there, there are some who, for whom that you gets pretty steep. And at some point you cross that line into depression um, substance abuse, self-harm, and death by suicide. Over 7,000 service members died in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, as you know. Over 30,000 veterans have died by suicide since September 11th. From my own unit, we had six killed in action. We've lost more than that to death by suicide and substance abuse. We had... Uh, you know, a person um, died by suicide about a month ago. One of our guys, one of the best non-commissioned officers in the unit, top 1% guy. Um, he, he lives in a dumpster. Lives in a dumpster in Northern California outside of a city library. He's a, he's a meth addict. And when he's ready to get better, I want to be in a position where we can help him. Um, I just, you know, I, and he's one story. I mean, I can't see this happening and not do something about it. These guys have my back for 15 months. 
and I can't, I can't do it alone. And so I thought we can put together this foundation and we can put ourselves in a position to help guys like Justin, who I just mentioned, as well as help other people who are you know, ready to sort of new heights, you know, help them build new businesses, help them find new careers, um, help their kids go to get to college. So that's what the Set Your Six Foundation is all about, supporting the living. And so the, the honor ride is going to honor the dead and it's going to support the living. How can we find Saber Six? Is there a website, uh, social media? Yeah, if you uh, you can find me on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, and and Facebook under Chris Kalenda or Christopher Kalenda. To find more about the Honor Ride, you go to honorride.us. So www.honorride.us, and yeah, you you'll get to our website. Yeah, I'll and, drop uh, links too for everybody. Yeah, as well. yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, and you can also go to strategicleadersacademy.com for my website and you'd be able to get in contact with me there and see all the things that we do. A lot of our things we do about leadership, culture, and strategy. And then also, uh, that also links into the Saber Six Foundation. I might actually go to the Strategic Leaders Academy. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> hey, that would be awesome. I'd love to have you. That'd be great. I'm looking forward to hopefully I'll be in DC at the time. I'd love to welcome you into the the great Arlington, Virginia area. I'm right up the road there. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, out. yeah, we're uh yeah, if you're uh if you're around that date, that Saturday the twenty second, and uh wanna do some pedal pedal in with us to Arlington. I may like actually be doing or, that and I'm yeah. prepping for a hundred mile ride, so I think it'd be great to to link up with you all. Definitely. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing your story. Everybody, you need to check out Zero Sum Victory, what we're getting wrong about war. Also, mm -hmm. Leadership, the Warriors Art, second edition. I got the second yeah. edition. And also, please, please, please check out Chris's ride, 1,700-mile ride, and the Saber Six Foundation, and donate what you can and support what you can. It's not always about the money. It's about getting a message out there. If you can't afford it, please share the links and share it to maybe some of those corporate bigwigs out there who have the big checkbook. And Chris, you're always welcome back in the show. Thanks, Chase. It's delightful being here. And uh, I look forward to, to reporting to your audience about how the ride went and, uh, and you know, anything else that they're interested in learning. Absolutely.